like to tell you about this year's speaker by way of introducing her, who is one of Blair's protégés and a former Gray Matter Fellow. So you see how this cycle of support has brought somebody to maturation uh, in the time span that this event has been ongoing. Carolyn Rodriguez was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. She went to Harvard College and then to Harvard Medical School. While there, she also obtained a PhD in neurobiology. She then came to Columbia for her training in clinical psychiatry. And after finishing, she uh, was involved in a research fellowship. Um, with the support of Gray Matters, she continued beyond her fellowship to work under Blair's mentorship and developed an extraordinary line of research into the basis, the pathological basis and the treatments for obsessive compulsive disorders and the newly identified group of hoarding disorders. I should also add that in the midst of her training, Carolyn got married, she had three children, and managed to, to manage the challenges of family and professional life brilliantly. I think it's fair to say that Carolyn is one person who probably does not need to read Sheryl Sandberg's new book, Lean In. <laughs> so in a way, this is, and there's no place that's more fitting than the Gray Matters at Columbia luncheon. This is uh, Carolyn's scientific coming out party where she's introduced to society as an independent investigator. So please join me in welcoming our faculty speaker for today, Dr. Carolyn Rodriguez. Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Rodriguez and I'm an assistant professor at Columbia. My research goal is to link the basic biology of the brain to the development of new treatments for patients. Gray Matters at Columbia Early Career Fellowship has been critical to the two projects that I'll tell you about today. The first focus is on alleviating symptoms in patients with severe obsessive compulsive disorder, also called OCD, with rapid acting medications. And the second project focuses on developing new treatments for individuals with hoarding disorder. First, let me tell you about OCD. It is characterized by repetitive intrusive thoughts that cause anxiety, called obsessions, and repetitive rituals called compulsions. In addition to these outward symptoms, patients also have intense private suffering that is debilitating in their daily lives. For example, one of my patients, whom I have disguised to protect her privacy, is a talented young woman a high school math teacher, and she gets stuck arranging and checking to make sure everything is symmetrical for three to four hours a day. She gets stuck preparing her son's breakfast. She gets stuck brushing her hair. And most painful to, to her, she gets stuck at the end of the workday in her classroom, unable to stop her OCD and to be able to get home to her family. Our frustration as clinicians is that current treatments for OCD take a long time, two to three months, to reduce symptoms. And even then, roughly half of patients will only have minor reductions in their symptoms. Imagine taking your brother to the doctor after he's fallen and broken his wrist and having the doctor tell you that your brother will need to take a pill for eight to 10 weeks, and if he's lucky, the pain will slightly lessen. This is not acceptable, and yet this is what I have to tell my OCD patients. We need better and faster acting treatments for OCD. My current research involves glutamate, the main neurotransmitter that is involved in the communication between nerve cells in the brain. There is increasing evidence that glutamate plays a role in OCD symptoms. Ketamine is a drug that changes levels of glutamate in the brain. Gray Matter sponsored the first clinical trial of ketamine, given IV or intravenously, in a group of my patients that had constant obsessions. The high school teacher I described volunteered to participate in this study. She responded to the infusion of ketamine, telling me, I feel as if the weight of OCD has been lifted. I want to feel this way forever. Indeed, looking at all the people who participated in the study together, we found a single dose of ketamine caused immediate and complete cessation of obsessive symptoms in half of individuals. In some, this effect persisted for up to one week. My patients and I were encouraged that they could have a vacation of sorts from their OCD. Our next step is to figure out how to get the effects of ketamine to last. 
We also want to develop ways to give ketamine in a more accessible manner. For example, ketamine is currently used in pain clinics as an intranasal spray. We want to see if we can use ketamine intranasally for OCD. The idea is, like my son, who has asthma, after two quick puffs of albuterol, he immediately feels better and can go outside and play with his friends. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use a device for the teacher stuck in her classroom that she can give to herself intranasally, break the OCD cycle, and go home to enjoy that precious time with her family? Another question I'd like to answer, how does ketamine affect the brain and reduce symptoms? Thus, our next step is to repeat the study in a larger group of patients and add brain scans during the infusion of ketamine to see where glutamate is changing in the brain to be able to locate the brain pathway responsible. My second research project is focused on hoarding disorder, which used to be considered part of OCD, yet is now considered a distinct entity. You may have read in the newspapers or seen on television individuals who have severe difficulty discarding possessions, leading them to barely be able to open their front doors wide enough to enter their homes. Hoarding has a tremendous public health impact and safety impact for individuals. Their neighbors, landlords, community agencies, and ultimately can lead to eviction. Although some treatments for hoarding exist, one of our biggest challenges is that individuals with hoarding disorder often do not seek help, and it comes at a great price. For example, one of my patients, who again is disguised, who is an emergency room nurse, who led me through a narrow corridor of possessions that reaches about shoulder height, described the crushing guilt she felt raising her only daughter in these suffocating and hazardous conditions. Only an eviction notice and the crisis of losing everything she owned motivated her to seek help. My current research project connects individuals facing the crisis of eviction with a one-on-one -on -one specialist who can connect them to mental health, legal, and skill-based group treatments. After two months, with the help of our team and her family, she herself has begun to clear her apartment of excessive possession and is, for the first time, optimistic about her chances. I would also like to answer the question, what is the brain process that causes individuals with hoarding to be so reluctant to part with their possessions? Then I'd like to develop treatments that can alter these brain circuits to help these patients. Gray Matters at Columbia Fellowship has been critical for the launch of these two projects that are focused on developing better treatments for these two severe disorders. Before I end, I want to talk to you about how the Gray Matters at Columbia group has been very meaningful to me beyond the research support. I first attended the Gray Matters Luncheon as a psychiatry resident five years ago in the Rainbow Room on top of the Rockefeller Center. And I remember at the time being incredibly sleep deprived, having just returned to work after maternity leave with my first son and wondering how I was gonna be able to manage the start of my postdoctoral fellowship. And then I heard Farrah Moynian, as you heard today, speak courageously about her family's story and what her sister Sharon and her mother, along with the Benefit Committee and Jeff and Rosemary Lieberman, were doing to help others through Gray Matters. I was drawn to her message of hope, as well as to the commitment and drive of the women I was sitting with at lunch. I left energized and eager to get back planning my fellowship research projects. I also want to highlight my outstanding research mentor, Dr. Blair Simpson. If you wouldn't mind, Blair, could you stand and wave? I know where you are. Thank you. She was the faculty speaker last year, as you heard Jeff say. And not only has she been a stellar scientific guide, but also a role model as a clinical researcher who is focused on helping our patients. We need more mentors like her to help move the exciting discoveries in basic science at the level of the molecule and cell to test how they can be relevant for treatments for patients who are suffering right now. Thank you so much, Blair. Blair and I also want to thank Dr. Lieberman, our chairman, who has supported me since I was a resident here in the program, in keeping with the extraordinary support he has for early career researchers. Finally, I want to thank Gray Matters at Columbia Committee and all the supporters here today for their contribution to Dr. Lieberman's vision. It is an exciting moment in psychiatry and for Columbia and Gray Matters to be working together to produce cutting edge treatments to provide relief to individuals with mental illnesses and ultimately relief to their families. Thank you so much.